I would love for you to tell the story about the foot baths. We just saw the gentleman who inspired one of the stories in your book yeah. about like the significance of giving a foot bath to someone, especially as a doctor. So talk about, A, why you were giving foot baths as a doctor in this unit and what that taught you. Yeah, it's a little bit embarrassing because, um, you know, I came, my last job as a resident was to be the um, medical senior in charge of the intensive care unit. You know, so that was June and July 1st, I'm at a clinic, you know, a sort of a makeshift clinic in the shelter. And I kept saying, you know, how tough can this be? I've handled the ICU. Um, you be careful of those things when they come up because it never is true. Uh, but I walked in and it, I walked in and I, it's my first job, I'm, you know, late 30s now, I finally have a job. Um, and I'm walking in as a doctor and I'm thinking they want me. Um, and if you know the nurses, they're like, are you kidding? So they said, the first thing I had to do um, was I ran into Barbara McGinnis was the name of the nurse who really was the spokesperson for the nurses. Um, and they explained to me that we had been trained all wrong, uh, that in residency, you know, you have to go very fast. You know, you're working all the time. You'll see three or four or five people in an hour, and you've got to get their, you know, get their chief complaint, diagnose them, and get the treatment going and move on. And if you don't do that, somebody's knocking on the door to say, can we do anything to help you move along? Um, and they said, that's never going to work with homeless people. You have to learn how to slow down. Um, and so they, I remember, never forget Barbara doing this. She took my stethoscope and put it in the drawer. She took everything I had that was medical and put it away. And she said, what we do around here is soak feet. Uh, and I was aghast, because when you walk into the to the clinic at Pine Street, around the periphery would be these really hardened street guys, uh, all sitting in these kind of um, chair, you know, the desks that used to have the arms like this over them, and, have, and the nurses were soaking their feet. Um, and it was kind of magic. And as Barbara pointed out to me, you had to take, I said, these are tough people. They're not going to trust you until they know you're, until you know you're going to stick around, until you know that, they, that you will listen to them, and that you're not here for your own agenda, that you're here to take care of them. So uh, the foot soak is kind of brilliant, because what it does, first of all, the nurses would call people in by their name. They'd say, you know, Mr. Williams, come on in, and can we offer you a foot soak? Um, and I hadn't thought about it, but many homeless people, if not most, uh, don't hear their name said, at least certainly not in any dignified way, um, for weeks at a time. So just the acknowledging somebody, what the nurses were doing, made people light up. It was really quite extraordinary. And then when they came in to have a foot soak, it was incredibly comforting, because it's warm water. Uh, and we used to put some betadine in there, which is why if you look at it, the, the water looks like it's color. Well, I don't know if that was really as sanitary as we thought it was, but we did that. Um, and then um, it flips the power structure, so it puts you at the feet of somebody and not in their personal space. So you know, when we're trained, we, as you all know, we like listen to hearts, and you're in looking in people's mouths and in their eyes. So you're right here in their personal space, and that did not work for many of the homeless folks. That was way too close. So the foot soak, which I had to do for two months, believe it or not, I was not allowed to do anything medical. So this is ICU to foot soaking, okay, really like that. Um, and uh, I resented it for like the first few weeks. And then I started to get the picture that what I was doing was investing time in getting people to trust me. And I could tell you story after story of that, but that became really the bedrock that we could then build our primary care stuff on. And if you think about trust, I mean, it's one of those things that maybe when we go to the doctor, we just take for granted, like, yes, I trust you, you're doing what you're doing. But when somebody doesn't trust you and you're trying to give them care, that's a very difficult position to be in, I'm imagining. Yeah, I think it's a position I had felt all the time, and we still feel a lot in the hospital or in a place where you have to see someone. You've only, you're in a busy emergency room. You've got a few minutes yeah, to see yeah. someone, and they're hurting and really or suffering, and you're trying to do something. And the mismatch in those settings is really dramatic. Mm -hmm. And I think this was kind of refreshing to see that there's another way to do it. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know who pays for something like that is another question. <laughs> but this, you know, time is probably the thing that's least paid for in the healthcare yeah. system now, mm -hmm. and probably one of the things that I would say is probably the most needed yeah. thing. And there are so many stories in the book that which, which highlight this, this personal connection and the significance of stories and knowing people's stories.